Hello friends, you're watching 3ABN Sabbath School panel. My name is Ryan Day and it is a blessing to have you guys joining us each and every week to study with us, to come together, open up God's Word. And of course, during this quarter, we're studying the three angels' messages found in Revelation chapter 14. And it's such a, a, a just a, a important message for our time. And so we want to thank you for joining us. I'm going to go ahead and introduce our panel members at this time. To my direct left is Ms. Shelley Quinn. Oh, I'm so excited to be here. We're so excited that you're joining us. I have Monday's lesson, The Son of Man Returns. Okay. And mine is Tuesday, The Heavenly Judgment. Instead of focusing on the entire process, we're going to focus on the central focal point. Amen. To, to your left is Pastor John Denzi. It's a blessing to have you, brother. It's a blessing to be here. I have Wednesday's lesson, and it's entitled, The Victor's Crown. Amen. And, of course, at the end of the table there is Miss Jill Morricone. Thank you, Ryan. I have Thursday. Every seed produces a harvest. Amen. All right, all right. Praise the Lord. And of course, we're studying lesson number two, which is entitled A Moment of Destiny. And uh, as always, we dare not dive into this study without first asking the Holy Spirit to lead and guide us. So, uh, Ms. Jill, would you have a prayer for us? Holy Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus, grateful for the gift of your word and grateful for the anointing of your Holy Spirit that's inherent in your word. And we ask right now that you would get us out of the way and that you could be seen, uplifted and glorified. Would you come and teach us now in Jesus' name? Amen. 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 You got to know that these messages, these three angels' messages are absolutely uh, imperative. They're absolutely important to the times that we're living in because they precede the second coming of Jesus Christ, which actually we, it helps us to understand this a little more in depth because when you end the third angel's message, you now have this interesting scene in which Jesus is seen on a cloud with a sickle in his hand. And of course, Revelation chapter 14, verses 14 and 15 helps us uh, to understand what's happening immediately after the third angel's message is delivered. And this is our memory text, again, Revelation 14, verses 14 and 15. And I'm reading from the New King James Version. And it says, Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud. And, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, and said, Thrust in your sickle, and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is is ripe. This is ultimately what we're preparing for. We're preparing for the soon return of Jesus Christ. And those three angels' messages help dial in the necessary salvational relationship that we need to have with Jesus Christ here in these last days. I'm going to go to Sabbath afternoon's lesson. And I just want to read... Uh, Pastor Mark Finley just has a way with words. He has a beautiful way of describing and illustrating and just helping us fully understand this message. And I want to read what he has there in Sabbath afternoon's lesson. And it says here, God has always spoken to his people, giving them whatever relevant truths they need to hear at the time. From the warning about the flood in Genesis chapter 6 to the first coming of Jesus, and of course in Daniel chapter 9 in the 70 weeks prophecy, to the pre-advent judgment of Daniel chapter 7 verses 9 and onward, to the final events before Christ's return there found in Revelation 12 to 14, God has spoken to us. In these last days of human history, He has sent a special message to the world and to His people designed to meet the need of the hour. He pictures this message as being carried by three angels flying in mid-heaven with their urgent end-time message to all the world. The three angels' messages is Jesus' final message of mercy. I love that. Yes. As many people think that God is a harsh judge and He's coming back, but I love it. It's a final message of mercy. A call that leads us from trusting in our own righteousness to trusting the righteousness of Jesus to justify us, to sanctify us, and at the end of time, to glorify us. Can't wait for that. As always, though we must choose Christ to surrender to Him and to obey Him, and the choices we make now will indeed impact the choices we make in the final crisis ahead of us. Thus now is the time to prepare. I love that. And that sets us up for Sunday's lesson, which is entitled Eternal Choices. And we find ourselves in Matthew chapter 24, verses 14, and we're also going to be looking at uh, the beginning portion there, or also the, uh, the verse there found in Revelation 14, 
verse 6. And you will see a comparison here. It says in Matthew chapter 24, verse 14, we're familiar with this. It says, And the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. And so, yes, this gospel of the world, of the kingdom, shall go into all the world prior to the second coming of Jesus. But now when you pair that to Revelation chapter 14, verse 6, Notice what it says. It says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them. So if you just have any doubt in your mind as to what these three angels' messages are all about, it's, it's coming under the banner of the everlasting gospel. Christ is proclaiming His righteousness, and He's trying to wake up this world to prepare for His soon return. And so having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and when it says that this gospel shall come, please, when it says to all the world, make no mistake, what that means, because it goes to clarify here in verse 6. It says, to the earth, to every nation, every kindred, and tongue, and people. So every single person on the globe will have a chance and an opportunity to hear the goodness of Jesus, to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ in some capacity. And of course, the lesson brings out that in th three times in Revelation 22, Jesus says that He is coming quickly. We see this in, in, in Revelation 22, verse 7, verse 12, and also in verse 20. But of course, in the context of this soon return, this quick return, he also proclaims in verse 11, he who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. And so every day by our choices, even in the so-called little things. Uh, and Pastor Mark Finley brings out that we are choosing either for or against Jesus. Many of you really put it like that. That's, that's a powerful thing to consider, that every choice we make is either for or against Jesus Christ. It's not likely that someone constantly making the wrong choices in their life now will suddenly, at the final crisis, come down on the side of Jesus, especially when the force of the whole world, the evil world, is against them. Mm -hmm. And of course, now today, every day, we must choose to be faithful to Jesus Christ and to his commandments. Of course, 1 John chapter 5, verse 3 reminds us that for it is the love of God that we keep his commandments. And of course, it's very interesting that in Last Day Events, page 295, we find this. It says, Jesus does not change the character at his coming. I love that. We, some people think they're going to live just however they want, all the way up to the second coming of Jesus. And oh, and when Jesus comes back, then God's going to do that marvelous change in me. Oh no, it says here in Last Day Events, page 295, Jesus does not change the character at His coming. The work of transformation must be done now. Our daily lives are determining our destiny. So Sunday's lesson is entitled Eternal Choices. And, and it's just a powerful uh, lesson to consider because we see examples all the way through Scripture. We see Scriptures that remind us constantly. We see messages and stories that remind us constantly of how important it is for us to make our choice today. For instance, Joshua chapter 24 and verse 15, in the days of Joshua, in the days of the wilderness, as they're coming into the land of milk and honey, as they're coming into Canaan, what does he say to the children of Israel? Choose for yourselves whenever you get a chance. This day. <laughs> whenever you get an opportunity, you know, when the time is right, when the weather is appropriate. No, 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 no. Choose for yourselves this day right. whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, Joshua made up his mind, we will serve the Lord. I love those words. Right. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Even in the days of, of Elijah, uh, that great showdown on Mark, Mount Carmel, where you have the false prophets of Baal and the one true prophet of God there, of course, there's a, a decision that needs to be made. Every Everyone has free will and free choice to choose where they will be and what side they will be. And right there in 1 Kings chapter 18 and verse 21, we see the message loud and clear. It says, And Elijah came to the people and said, How long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people answered him not a word. We have many people that are serving the Baals of this word, of this world, even today when their heart is in Babylon, but yet they may also profess the name of Jesus. It's a dangerous thing. And we need to make sure that we have our fate and our decision and our life sealed up in Jesus Christ. Right. Even in Joel's day, Joel chapter 3, verses 13 and 14, we find these words. It says, put in the sickle. We just read about the sickle earlier. It says, put in the sickle for the harvest is ripe. Come, go down, for the wine press is full, the vats overflow, for their wickedness is great. And then he says these words, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. Mm. 
Uh, are you dwelling in the valley of decision? Or have you made your decision to serve Jesus today? Why halt, why, why falter between two opinions? Elijah would say right here. He says multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The day of the Lord is near upon us all. And we didn't need to have made our decision to follow him well before he arrives. And then of course, second Corinthians chapter six, verse two, how can you talk about making a decision to follow Jesus and leave this scripture out where Paul writes and says in an acceptable time, I have heard you and that a day of salvation, I have helped you behold. Now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. And this is where I think the pre-tribulation rapture theory, as I was studying this lesson, that kept popping into my mind because this is where I think that that theory fails because so many people buy into this idea that, you know what, I'm just going to live my life as long as I mentally accept Jesus and I mentally believe that he's my savior and I mentally accept the fact that nearly 2000 years ago, he died on the cross for my sins. That's all I need. I can just keep living however I want because I am saved. And you know what, if I miss the mark, if I miss the point, oh, I might have to go through seven horrible years of tribulation, but I'll be given a second chance during the seven years of tribulation after the rapture. What a deadly, deadly, deadly teaching. And this is where it falls because it it teaches people that they don't have to live for God now. They don't have to make those necessary choices and changes now. If they miss the point down the road, they might be given a second chance down the road. Have mercy. Mm. It's not enough to just mentally believe, but to practice for change of character. Listen to what it says here. It says, he who will build up a strong symmetrical character, he who would be a well-balanced Christian must give all and do all for Christ. For the Redeemer will not accept divided service. Daily he must learn the meaning of self-surrender. He must study the Word of God, learning its meaning and obeying its precepts. Thus he may reach the standard of Christian excellence. And I love these words. Day by day God works with him, perfecting the character. That is to stand in the time of final test. And there it is again, day by day, the believer is working out before men and angels, a sublime experiment showing what the gospel can do for fallen human beings. And of course, education, page 105, these, these are just powerful quotes that help illustrate the very purpose of this lesson. And it says here, the germination of the seed, Jesus often, often used gardening or, or uh, uh, you know, the plants and the, you know, he'd use these different illustrations to explain the kingdom of God. But I love this right here in education, page 105 and 106. It says the germination of the seed represents the beginning of spiritual life and the development of the plant is a figure of the development of character. There can be no life without growth. The plant must either grow or die as its growth is silent and imperceptible, but continuous. So is the growth of character. At every stage of development, our life may be perfect, yet if God's purpose for us is fulfilled, there will be constant advancement. Amen. Eternal choices. We have that now. Amen. 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 Thank you, Brian. Amen. That was beautiful. I'm Shelley Quinn. My lesson is based on Revelation 14, 14, and it's titled, The Son of Man Returns. Let's look at Revelation 14, 14. John writes, Then I looked... And behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. What, who, is, who is John seeing? Hmm. He's seeing Jesus Christ. Yes. Mm -hmm. Why is he calling him the Son of Man? The everlasting gospel which is the foundation of the three angels' messages of Revelation 14. The everlasting gospel was announced in the garden in Genesis 3.15 when God said to the woman or to the serpent that the woman was going to give birth to a seed and he would crush the serpent's head. Mm -hmm. That is, in 30 words, talking <laughs> about God's plan to become a man and to save us. So when the Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary, she conceived an existing person, the second person of the Godhead. And their two natures, his divine nature, her human nature, were knitted together. He had no biological father, but he became the son of humanity. 
Hebrews 2.14 says, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself, Jesus, likewise shared in the same, mm -hmm. that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. So why did God become a man? He was born to die, to start a new bloodline. In Romans 5, it talks about death entering through the world through one man. Let's yeah. look at that. The first representative of humanity from whom all were made from one blood. That's what Acts 17, 26 says, that every nation of humanity came from the one man, Adam. Romans 5.15 says, by the one man's offense, Adam's offense, mm -hmm. many died. Much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to mm -hmm. many. Mm -hmm. So Christ became the new representative of humanity, the last Adam. That's what Paul calls him in 1 Corinthians 15, 45. He says, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. So he started a new bloodline. And when we are born again, the whole nation of Christ, God's people, will come from that one blood. Only a perfect man could take humanity's place and be our substitute to die to pay the penalty for our sins and only the precious blood of Jesus Christ, our creator God himself, was worth, had the value to pay the penalty for all of mankind. Now, you know, it is amazing to think of his humanity. While he was on earth, Jesus laid down his independent authority. He did not, he said, I only do what the Father said to do. I only say what he tells me to say. He didn't call on his own divine power, but he relied on the power of the Holy Spirit just as you and I must. But he took on humanity permanently. Mm -hmm. Think about that mm -hmm. for a minute. Our creator, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. The word became flesh. He humiliated himself to take on our flesh, but forever. Oh, if you understand the plan of salvation, yeah. you will stand in holy wonder of mm -hmm. the love of God. And then he shared this humanity so that when he said it is finished on the cross, he was talking about he paid the penalty, the first aspect to justify us by his righteousness. That was done, but he took on our humanity and took it back to heaven that he may become a sympathetic high priest. Mm -hmm. His ministry continues. Mm -hmm. Hebrews 4.15 says, we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. He faced the full fury mm -hmm. of Satan's temptations. Do you think he doesn't understand your trials? He does. He understands and relates to our struggles with temptations because he was tempted in all points as we were, mm -hmm. yet he never sinned. Mm -hmm. So he overcame all of that in the flesh of humanity by the power of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Did you know our creator became the person of Jesus Christ? He's called son of man, son of God. There's so many titles for Jesus. You know what his favorite title for himself was? Son of man. He used it 82 times. I want to read a few to you. In Matthew 8, verse 20, Jesus said, Foxes have holes, mm -hmm. birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man, <laughs> God in the flesh, has nowhere to lay his head. In Matthew 12, 8, he says, For the Son of Man is the Lord even 
of the Sabbath. Matthew 18, 11, he says, the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. Matthew 20, 24 says, he said, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Mm -hmm. The same Jesus who walked the face of the earth among men is the one who's going to be returning again from heaven. Amen. In Revel, I mean, Ma Mark 14, 62, he, Jesus said, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. He's going to return and every eye will see him. Well, he's going to return with all of his angels. And that's where John is saying in Revelation 14, 14, I looked and behold a white cloud and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man having on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle. He's coming to harvest mm -hmm. the earth, to rescue his redeemed. You know, this echoes the same emphasis of Christ's humanity from the prophetic vision of Daniel 7, 13 and 14. Daniel sees mm -hmm. one who is like the Son of Man, who proceeded from the ancient of days and was given universal authority. Matthew 16, 27. Jesus said, the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. Mm -hmm. So right now, when he returns, he says, my reward is with me. Matthew 24, 27 says, Jesus says, as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. He will circle this globe with lightning speed. Verse 30 says, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven and all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see this. All the tribes of the earth will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with great power and great glory. Does that sound like a secret coming? Mm -hmm. Does that no. sound like a secret rapture? Matthew 25 verses 31 and 32. Jesus says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory and all the nations will be gathered before him. And there's a judgment. He says, he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goat. Mm -hmm. So the Bible tells us that Jesus is the Son of Man. He's going to return in all of his glory. He will divide in judgment the sheep from the goats. And the destiny of all nations and all humanity will be decided for eternity. Let me ask, are you ready to meet the Son of Man. Mm. Mm. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Shelley, for that beautiful lesson. My friends, you're not going to want to go anywhere. We're just going to take a short break and we'll be right back. Ever wish you could watch a 3 ABN Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3ABNSabbathSchoolPanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. Hello, friends. Welcome back to 3ABN Sabbath School Panel. We're going to pass it over to Pastor John Lomaking for Tuesday's lesson. And mine is the Heavenly Judgment and... Surprisingly enough, we are also on Revelation 14, 14. So if you have your Bibles, go there with me. We read, Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud. And on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. I think that you 
me and John are going to have fun with this one verse. And you? You'll be amazed. You also, Jill? Mine's coming later. Okay. <laughs> it is amazing how much is contained in one verse. We're going to squeeze this orange. <laughs> so I'm going to take a different example, a different approach here, but one of the things I'd like to reiterate very quickly is um, God uses clouds in amazing ways. But I want to just first hit on the, the cadence of what you started building on, uh, the fact of this same Jesus. Yes. This same Jesus. Mm -hmm. Acts 1, verse 9 yeah. to 11 is where we see yeah. the clouds also introduced. Yes. Now, when he had spoken these things while they watched, he was taken up in a cloud, received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go. I want to focus on the this same Jesus aspect and the clouds putting that together. What's so wonderful about that is the this same Jesus. Now, in the minds of the disciples, that meant a whole lot. And let me just go down a few things because they walked with Jesus. And, and I'm sure that in each of their minds, something different about this same Jesus came up. For example, there is a divine truth embedded in the passage in the phrase, this same Jesus. Let's consider some of those. What same Jesus? The same Jesus that walked the dusty streets of Nazareth. Mm -hmm. That's who they thought about. What yeah. Jesus? The same Jesus that ministered to crowds on the streets of Jerusalem. Yeah. What Jesus? The same Jesus that healed the sick in the villages of Israel. That yeah. same Jesus. What Jesus? The same Jesus who preached on the grassy hills of Galilee. Yeah. That same Jesus. So yeah. each, of the, each of these, that same Jesus, each of the disciples, a different spark is going off. And they say, you mean the one that healed? No, the one that, the one that was on, the one that calmed us, the one that d delivered the demoniac. That same Jesus. Yeah. The same Jesus who was crucified and rose again is the one that's coming back. Yeah. This same Jesus, Thank he's you. coming back in clouds. And when he comes back, he's coming back for a number of reasons. In the context of the judgment, the reason why we have confidence is he is the presiding judge in the judgment. Yes. Let's look at John 5, yeah. verse 22 and 23. Yes. This same Jesus, that lowly Jesus is now gonna be sitting in a different capacity. John 5, 22 and 23, for the father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the son that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. That's why Jesus says, you believe in God, believe also in me. Yeah. And there are a lot of people that believe in God, but don't believe in Jesus. You cannot get to the Father except through Jesus. Mm -hmm. So he said, the one you reject is going to be the one you face in the judgment. Mm -hmm. How fitting is it, is it for us wow. to get to know the one that we're going to face in the judgment? The other one is Jesus is our advocate in the judgment. Now, this blows me away. He's a judge and the lawyer. That's a hung court. <laughs> you know, when judgment was made in favor of the saints, I see now why. Yeah. Sitting on the bench, Jesus. Standing with me on my side, Jesus. Try to figure out that divine uh, dichotomy. It's Amen. impossible. But notice what the Bible says, 1 John 2, verse 1. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So how could the courts be set in any other beautiful setting than to know that Jesus is my advocate and Jesus is my judge? You know, there's a picture in Revelation when it comes to the seven churches where, where Jesus is talked about as giving a white stone. Well, think about the stone. Who is the stone? Christ. Who is the white stone, the pure stone? Jesus. And in the Roman court, similar to today, if the jury could not come up with a verdict, the beautiful words, I will give you a white stone mm -hmm. with a new name on it. Now, get the, get the picture. I studied this. In the court, there was a leather bag, kind of like, let's make a deal. You have to put your hand in there and pick out <laughs> the chips. Well, in that bag were two stones, a white one and a black one. And your life hung on which one you chose. Wow. If you chose the black stone, you would be hung. You'd be crucified in the Roman court. If you chose the white stone, not only would you be exonerated and declared innocent, but you'll have a name change so that nobody understands, nobody identifies you as the one that you were accused to be. Look at the setting. So here's the accused and he has his advocate, Jesus, by his side. Let me use Shelley as an example. And he says, wait, before you go into the back, I'm going to give you a white stone with a new name on it. You hold on to that. 
<laughs> you put your hand in that bag with the blessed assurance that you're going to only take out what went in. <laughs> Amen? Amen. That's the beautiful, the, the cord is hung. Judgment was made in Baby. favor of yeah. the saints. And the time came for them to possess the kingdom. So he's, he's our advocate. Yeah. The third thing is he is our hope in the judgment. Mm -hmm. First John 5 verse 12. He who has the son has, has life. life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. What a beautiful picture. So whom do we need to have in the judgment? The Son. Mm -hmm. And finally, Jesus is our confidence in the judgment. 1 John 2, verse 28. And now, little children, abide in me, that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. But now let me take a short twist about the clouds here. I'm going to show four, four things about the clouds. I did a sermon not too long ago called Coming with Clouds, in which I learned something about God that clouds are amazing. My wife and I were driving to Florida and we went through a terrible rainstorm just after we got married and it was just black clouds. Mm -hmm. When we came out on the other side of that torrential rainstorm wrapped in black clouds, our car was cleaner than it had ever been before. <laughs> what am I saying? What am I saying? Clouds are a precursor to the cleansing of your life. Mm -hmm. God sometimes brings clouds. It's a precursor to the promises of God. That's why we find in Genesis chapter 9, verse 12 to 15, the cloud put in the proper context. The Bible says in verse 13 of Genesis chapter 9, I set my rainbow in the cloud. And it shall be for the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. It shall be when I bring the, a cloud over the earth. We think of cloud as bad news. When I bring a cloud, that the rainbow shall be seen in the cloud. Oh, this is powerful. No clouds, no rainbows. Here's the cadence. No clouds, no rain, no rain, no rainbow, no rainbow, no covenant. Mm. Mm. So when clouds are coming, these are the precursor. When there are clouds in your life, clouds in your marriage, clouds in your family. Mm. It's a precursor that the blessing is coming, yes. coming that God yeah. is about to bless your life. Also, clouds are a confirmation of the presence of God. We find there in Exodus 33, verse 9 and 10, he says, And it came to pass when Moses entered the tabernacle that the pillar of cloud descended. Who was in the cloud? The presence of God. <laughs> you see, friends, when the clouds are in your life, don't look at clouds as always a negative thing because God uses clouds in ways that we don't understand. When the cloud was there, the presence of God was there. God uses clouds to bring us to the place where we worship him. And that's what happened when they saw the cloud. They fell down in the temple and they worshiped God. But thirdly, Clouds are a preparation for the revelation of the glory of God. By the way, in Nahum, uh, in Nahum 1 verse 3, the beautiful thing about this, another profound truth about clouds that we often miss is Nahum 1 verse 3 says, the clouds are the dust of his feet. Hmm. You want to hear a revelation? If there's dust in your family, God's presence is there. Mm -hmm. If there's dust in your marriage, dust in your job, dust in your church, dust in your neighborhood, dust Clouds are the dust of God's feet. He's not absent. He's present in the clouds. How do I know that? When Jesus was on the cross, the clouds that hovered over that area, when Jesus was being crucified, the Father was hidden in the cloud. He was not absent. He was present in the cloud. So friends, are there clouds in your life? If there are clouds in your life, don't think it's the absence of God. It's the silent presence of God hovering closer to you than he's ever been before. Don't think of clouds as an adversarial sign. Think of clouds as a preparation for the revelation of God's glory. That's why the Bible says, Romans 8 and verse 18, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed. What kind of glory? Behold, he cometh with clouds. When he comes with clouds in your life, the glory of God is going to be accompanying him. So I ask you today, are there clouds in your life? One of my favorite authors said in uh, my utmost force highest, July 29th, he says, what a revelation is it to know that sorrow, bereavement and suffering are actually the clouds that come along with God. Mm. That's deep. So whatever you're facing, it may be cloudy to you, but I say it in the words of all of us who've seen clouds before, behind every cloud, mm. there's a silver lining, yeah. and that lining is Jesus. So yes, he's coming with clouds. The clouds precede the glory of God, and when the clouds dissipate, the presence of God will be clear. Trust the clouds. God is in them. Mm. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. It's time to close the church and go home. <laughs> <laughs> Praise the Lord. Well, I have 
Uh, Wednesday's portion of the lesson is called the Victor's Crown. My name is John Dinsey, and we are moving uh, again back to Revelation chapter 14, verse 14. Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. Uh, and I will stop there. You know, the, my focus is on the victor's crown, the golden crown that Jesus wore. But before he wore that golden crown, uh, I have to take you back. Even before he came to this earth, he was the subject of praise and adoration in heaven. Mm -hmm. And he came to this earth and became a babe. But on this earth, his uh, suffering intensified uh, as he was living among men. And... The Bible says that he went about doing good. And this Jesus was attacked by the devil severely every single day of his life, attacked, attacked, attacked by the devil. But Jesus, victorious, victorious, victorious. And if there was some kind of scoreboard, the devil was losing every single day. Amen. Praise the Lord for that, because Jesus was victorious. And so the Bible says he went about doing good. The devil didn't like that. <laughs> he went about doing good. Well, he was uh, healing the sick. He was giving sight to the blind. The cripples were able to walk and even the dead were raised. And I'd like to take your mind to imagine the moment when somebody says, hey, weren't you the guy that was blind? Uh, asked, begging for money. What happened to you? Jesus, Jesus <laughs> came by and gave me sight. That's right. And uh, hey, hey, aren't you the guy that was crippled begging for money over there by the temple? <laughs> yes, but Jesus came by mm. and he healed me. Yeah. And well, I imagine that fifth day after Lazarus was resurrected on the uh, four days he was in the grave, fifth day he goes to the market. Hey, wait a minute. Didn't you die <laughs> about four or five days ago? Well, yes, but Jesus called me for, forth from the grave. Yes. And so victory after victory through Jesus. And it's amazing when you look at the lesson, uh, Pastor Mark Finley brings out this very important thing. Concerning the golden crown, he says, John describes Jesus as the Son of Man having on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle. The word for crown is Stephanos. It is a victor's crown. When an athlete won an important contest, he was given a Stephanos, a crown of honor, of glory, of victory. But he says, Jesus once wore a crown of thorns, symbolizing shame and mockery. He was once despised and rejected of men. He was reviled, ridiculed, spat upon, beaten and whipped. But now he wears a crown of glory Amen. and comes again but now as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This is Jesus. And he brings out that before he got, he, before he's able to wear that crown of uh, golden crown, he wore a crown of thorns. Now, why did Jesus who went about doing good mm. have to wear a crown of thorns? And you know, it's interesting because they say that thorns are like a symbol of sin. It's like he was saying he was king of the sinners. Mm. <laughs> and he faced such ridicule. I mean, uh, the scribes and the Pharisees, the very demons were there at the, you know, you mentioned God was there in the cloud, but the, the demons were there uh, working on the hearts of people and minds mm. to keep saying things, come down from the cross and speaking horrible things about Jesus. But do, what do we hear Jesus saying? Father, yes. forgive them yeah. for right. they know not yeah. what they do. It's amazing what Jesus suffered for you and me so that we can have salvation. Amen. And guess what? If you follow Jesus with all your heart, there is a crown of life waiting for you. That's right. Isn't that marvelous? Yeah. I'm reading to you from a letter written by a manuscript release, 44 from 1886. Christ was despised and rejected of man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Isaiah 53, 3. What was it that brought such sorrow? Mm. It was not on his own account, but for the sins of the people. He realized their condition, and this was the reason he, that he felt such sorrow. As he wept over Jerusalem and uttered the lamentable words, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, as a hen doth gather her brood under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. Jesus wept 
over Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Jesus weeps over those do not <laughs> that do not accept His call to eternal life. That's right. Jesus is inviting you to walk with Him yeah. and live with Him because He accompanies us. Yeah. He promises to be with us always, even until the end of the world. And again, I go back to the lesson. It talks about Jesus. It says here in uh, the lesson, John describes Jesus as the son of man having on his uh, head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle. The word for crown is Stephanos, uh, as which we already said. But then he goes into talking about uh, that Jesus uh, likens uh, many things in the Bible. He looked at the things around and he uses the sower went out to sow. And some seeds fell on good ground. Some, and he goes on like this. But you see, uh, there's a, he points out Mark chapter 4. I'll read that to you, beginning in verse 26. And he said, The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground and should sleep by night and rise by day, and the seed should sprout and grow. He himself does not know how, for the earth yields crop by itself, first the blade, then the head, after that the full grain in the head. But when the grain ripens, immediately he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. In the same manner, there's going to be a harvest. Mm. And you'll hear more about that in a moment. But the part that we have to do is cooperate with Jesus so that he continues uh, working in us. And this is the uh, thought that is brought out by Pastor Mark Finley in the lesson. Uh, is he says the sanctification is the work of a lifetime. He's quoting from Christ Object Lessons, page 65. Sanctification is a work of a lifetime. As our opportunities multiply, our experience will enlarge and our knowledge increase. So we work day by day with Jesus so that uh, he is preparing us and, and uh, moving in our hearts so that we grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And in Jude chapter 1, verse 20 and verse 21, it's only one chapter, it says, But you, beloved, building yourselves up on our most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Every day we should have our focus on Jesus, have our focus in heaven because we're just passing through yes. this world. Colossians chapter 1, uh, beginning in verse 9. For this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and in spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. God has it in His plan that we can daily increase in the knowledge of God. Do you remember that Jesus says, come unto me? Mm -hmm. And then as you continue reading there in Matthew 11, verse 28, eventually he says, learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart. Mm -hmm. This is an open invitation for us because daily we can learn of Jesus. I continue reading there in Colossians chapter 1, and it says now in verse 11, strengthen with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has, listen, qualified us yes. to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. In the King James Version it says, makes us meet. He qualifies us because of what Jesus Christ has done on the cross. You are qualified to be a child yes. of God if you accept, because it says in John chapter 1, as many as receive them, to them he gives power to become yes. Children of God, sons of God, you can be a child of God today, right now, mm -hmm. yes. if you accept Jesus. Mm -hmm. He will qualify you. And it says, uh, continuing on in verse 13, He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son yes. of His love, in whom we have redemption. redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. We have redemption in Jesus through His blood. So you remember that it says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, by grace are you saved through faith. Mm -hmm. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. He qualifies you. He prepares you. He keeps you moving and growing and prepare you to be like Him. 
Mm -hmm. I have to finish. It says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 and 12, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Praise the Lord. God has his servants and we all grow together unto the stature of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you so much, each one of you. Just what a beautiful picture of Jesus. Amen. Jesus as the Son of Man. Jesus as our judge and advocate. Jesus as our Savior and soon coming King. I'm Jill Morricone. On Thursday, we look at every seed produces a harvest. Before we jump into our passage of study, I want to talk to you just a moment about seeds and harvest. Do you know that whatever you plant is going to come up? That's if right. you plant corn, do you get wheat? No, you would receive corn. If you plant wheat, are you going to get something different? Turnips? No, you're going to get wheat. Every seed eventually produces a harvest. Mm -hmm. Now, Greg likes to garden. I'm not a good gardener, but Greg loves to garden. And when he gardens, he plants his tomatoes or sweet potatoes. We love to do sweet potatoes or whatever he's growing in the garden. And you know, a couple days after that, what starts to come up? Weeds. And they grow with the plants that he planted. Now, you know what he does? He pulls up those weeds right away. I'm picking up this weed and I'm picking up that weed because I want all the nutrients to go into the good seed that I have planted. But you know, God is the master gardener. He allows the weeds to grow. He allows the weeds to flourish along with the good seed so that everything fully ripens and produces a harvest. That's what we see in our lesson today. When Jesus comes as the Son of Man on the cloud with the glory of the angels comes to bring, what's he coming for? He's coming for judgment. Mm -hmm. What do we see? Revelation 22, verse 11. What does it say? He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. So what does that mean? When he's coming the second time, his reward is with him. Right. And at that point, we see fully revealed the character of God's people, that they fully represent Jesus. And at that point, the wicked are, you could say, fully, uh, what's the word, fully entrenched in rebellion mm -hmm. against God. We see this, uh, we've already read Revelation 14, uh, verse 14, we've read multiple times. And verse 15, we see the angel coming out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, that's Jesus, thrust in your sickle and reap. Here comes the reap, this is the harvest. For the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. Now this is, Pastor Mark Finley called it the golden grain. This is the righteous but then we see in verses 17 through 20, he calls them the gory grapes. This is the wicked. And we pick up that. We're looking at Revelation 14, verse 17. Let's see the wicked. We see that their wickedness and evilness is fully mature. And here comes the judgment. Revelation 14, 17, another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven. He also having a sharp sickle, verse 18. And another angel came out from the altar. Now let's pause a moment. The angel that came out from the altar, it's probably, this is the same altar that's mentioned in Revelation chapter eight, verses three through five. That's the introduction to the seven trumpets. Of course, the trumpets showcase what? The judgment on the wicked in response to the prayers of the righteous. So this angel that comes out from the altar, what does the angel have? Power over fire. This is the angel who commands the fires of God's final judgment. He cries with a loud cry to him who had the sharp sickle saying, thrust in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine to the earth. These are the gory grapes. These are the wicked. For the grapes, they're fully ripe, fully developed in sin. Mm -hmm. 
You know, the cluster, it's interesting to me. We have the figure of this harvest. We have the ancient Palestinian agriculture year, and they had two main harvests, the grain harvest and the vintage harvest, or the grape harvest. And we see here, this represents the wicked who will be destroyed by the brightness of his coming, of course, at Jesus' second coming. And I think also it could have a dual application, you could say, at the end of the thousand years, the wicked we know will be fully exterminated or fully annihilated. Verse 19. So the angel thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it into the great wine press of the wrath of God. Now that reminds me of the third angel's message, right? Revelation 14, 10. He himself shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. It reminds me of Revelation 15, verse 1. I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them the wrath of God is complete. Also, if you study Isaiah chapter 63, you see another reference to the wine press of God. The people in that passage made their irrevocable choice. They were never going to repent. They were never going to turn back to God. And that's what we see with the gory grapes that are fully developed in wickedness at the end of time. There, even if God gave them another million years, they would never repent. They would never turn back to God because their wickedness is fully ripened and developed. Verse 20. The wine press was trampled outside the city and blood, this is kind of gory, came out of the wine press up to the horse's bridles for 1,600 furlongs. Now it's interesting, it talks about outside the city. In the Old Testament, in Joel, I think, uh, Ryan, you read this verse, Joel 3, verses 12 and 13, it talks about the nations being wakened. Come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there I was sit to judge all the surrounding nations. Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, go down, for the winepress is full, the vats overflow. Their wickedness is great. And then multitudes, mm -hmm. multitudes are in the valley of decision. So what is the point of all this? You could read all that and say, why am I reading that? What is the point? Here's three lessons from the harvest of the grain and the grapes. Lesson number one, there is coming a judgment. We can live like there is no coming judgment, like there is no tomorrow, but it doesn't change the fact that the judgment of God is coming. Mm -hmm. You know, the parable that Jesus told about in Luke chapter 12, the rich fool, and he lived like there was no coming judgment. And what did God say in Luke 12, 10? Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Mm. Lesson number two, the choices you and I make today will predict our destiny. You see, it's daily choices. It's little choices. It's what we choose to sow that has an impact for eternity. Galatians 6, 6 verses 7 and 8. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap life everlasting. You see, every day we can make choices for ourselves or for Satan, because really whether we choose self or Satan, it's the same choice. Hosea 8 verse 7, what happens if we choose that? They sow the wind and reap the whirlwind. Hosea 10 verse 13 you plowed wickedness, you reaped iniquity. You ate the fruit of lies because you trusted in your own way, in the multitude of your mighty men. But by contrast, you and I can make daily choices for Jesus. What happens then? Hosea 10 verse 12. Sow for yourselves righteousness, reap mercy, Break up your fallow ground. It's time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness on you. And also James 3, verse 18. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those 
who make peace. Mm -hmm. Finally, lesson number three. Every seed produces a harvest. And that harvest is going to be clear. There will be two camps, only two. And there's always been only two camps. The grain and the grapes, the wheat and the tares, the wise and foolish virgins, the sheep and the goats. And Noah's time, it was those in the boat who were saved and those outside of the boat. Mount Carmel, Elijah's time, it was those who followed God and those who followed Baal. So the question comes down to, I think Ryan was the one who read this verse, Joshua 24, 15. Choose you this day mm -hmm. whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, mm -hmm. we will serve the Lord. There is coming a judgment. Be in the righteous grain. Amen. 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 Thank you guys so much. Powerful lesson indeed. Let's get some final thoughts. The Son of Man came to seek and save that was which was lost. And I just have to say, he didn't die on the cross for us so that we could live like the devil. Uh, we are to follow in his pathway of righteousness. That's right. Revelation 1, 7, behold, he is coming with clouds. Mm -hmm. Since we know that, it's time to get ready for that wonderful return. Mm -hmm. Amen. And Jesus has been victorious, and through him, we can also be victorious. Amen. What an incredible blessing that we have probationary time to make choices today and every day for Jesus. Amen. We live in a time where it's time for us to live and to practice what it is that we believe. That's why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, Therefore, if whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on a rock. And of course, we know that rock to be Jesus Christ, our Lord. My friends, we thank you so much for joining us today, but you're for sure not going to want to miss next week because next week's lesson here on 3ABN Sabbath School panel, we're going to be taking on lesson number three entitled The Everlasting Gospel. This is the very foundation of the three angels' messages, the very foundation of what we believe and why we exist. Until next week, God bless you all. See you soon. <laughs>